Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of Wikimania 2012, James Hare. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Wikimedia District of Columbia, I would like to welcome all of you to Wikimania 2012. I would like to thank our partners and collaborators, the U.S. Department of State Office of E-Diplomacy, the Library of Congress, the Wikimedia Foundation, Wikimedia Deutschland, the National Archives and Records Administration, Open Hatch, and the Broadcasting Board of Governors for working with us to make this conference possible. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Google, Ask.com, Zoomf, the Encyclopedia of Life, the Richard Lounsbury Foundation, Wikia, the Sailor Foundation, and Wikihow for their generous contributions. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank our incredible conference organizing team, which has been working in one way or another since January 22nd, 2011, to make this conference possible. Nicholas Bashor, Katie Filbert, Tiffany Smith, Urshaya Gienes, uh, Doror Lin, Sage Ross, Chad Horaho, and our legion of volunteers, all led by Danny B. Yeah. I would also like to point out that during this conference, there will be many side events taking place during the evening. Tonight, we have Glam Night Out at the Museum and the official Wikimania Happy Hour sponsored by Zoomf at Tonic. Check out the information desk on the third floor of the Marvin Center if you'd like to learn more about our side events. I'm glad you could join us this morning with this excellent weather. You see, I edited the Wikipedia article on DC Summers to say that we don't have 100 degree heat waves, and apparently it worked. <laughs> if you have attended a previous Wikimania, welcome back. If this is your first Wikimania, I'd like to introduce you to the events of the next few days. Wikimania is where you go to meet the people who work on Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, which is maintained by volunteers and operated by the Wikimedia Foundation. That's Wikimedia with an M. The, Wiki the Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit organization that runs Wikipedia, Wiktionary, Wikiquote, Wikibooks, Wikisource, Wikinews, Wikiversity, Wikispecies, the MediaWiki Software Project, Wikimedia Commons, and I'd like to introduce our latest project under development, Wikidata. Volunteers for all these projects and more will be here today discussing their latest findings and pondering the future of the Wikimedia projects. It is going to be an exciting four days. But first, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Don Nunziato. Professor Nunziato is an internationally recognized expert in the area of free speech and the internet. Her primary teaching and scholarship interests are in the areas of internet law, free speech, and digital copyright. She recently published her book, Virtual Freedom, Net Neutrality and Free Speech in the Internet Age, and has lectured and written extensively on issues involving free speech in the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dun Nunziata. Good morning, and thank you for that kind welcome. On behalf of GW Law School, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, Lisner Auditorium. It's a great honor for GW Law School to partner with the uh, Department of State on important and exciting events like this one. And GW Law School, under our relatively new dean, Paul Berman, has been particularly committed to bridging the gap between the ivory tower of academia and uh, the, the real world of law and policy and practice. We are particularly committed to capitalizing on our location in the uh, nation's capital and are very honored to sponsor uh, and support events like this. Uh, as was said, at, at GW Law, professors like, like myself uh, are particularly focused on cyber law issues. I, I teach in the area of internet law, 
digital copyright and free speech. And uh, toward that end, with Microsoft's generous support, my colleague Arturo Carrillo and I uh, created a program and a speaker series on global internet freedom and human rights. We're very excited to be sponsoring a number of speakers in connection with that speaker series. Vint Cerf is going to come and speak to us uh, in a couple of months. Ai Weiwei, Chinese human rights activist, uh, is hopefully going to be led out of China to come speak to us on uh, global internet freedom issues. We sponsored Rebecca McKinnon, the author of Consent of the Network and uh, an internet free speech activist last year as part of the Distinguished Speaker Series, so we're really excited about that. GW Law was recently chosen to be the, the new home of the Federal Communications Law Journal. Uh, we look forward to working with the Federal Communications Bar here in DC on cutting edge issues of communications law. And in connection with that, uh, FCC Chairman Janikowski is going to come to speak to us to, to launch that new journal in, in a few months. So we're very active uh, on these types of issues and, and we're, we're very excited to be sponsoring and, and supporting events like these. Uh, I'm also very proud of the work of my colleagues Dan Solov and uh, Oren Kerr, who you may be familiar with, who are leaders in the areas of internet privacy and cybercrime. So we got a lot going on here at GW Law. And in particular, our new dean, Paul Berman, is a world-renowned expert in internet law issues and the author of a, a, a well-regarded casebook on the subject. So once again, uh, welcome to all of you and on with the show. At Wikimania, we have the great privilege of working with the US Department of State for our Tech at State track. Our next speaker, Richard Boley, is a career US diplomat and the current director of the Office of E-Diplomacy, an applied technology think tank for the US Department of State. Previously, he was a National Security Affairs Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where he launched the Global Entrepreneurship Program. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Boley. Good morning, Wikipedians and Wikimedians. My name is Richard Boley, and I am uh, part of the Office of E-Diplomacy at the State Department. Despite the suit, we feel that we are kindred spirits with you. Uh, actually, I would like to ask all the people from E-Diplomacy here to stand up briefly. Just stand up so you can search them out and find out more about what we're doing. We're so excited to be able to partner with you and with GW Law School, and we will have, uh, as part of our Tech at State tracks, some really interesting presentations which dovetail perfectly with the conference. Uh, actually, um, one of the two best known platforms that we have, or products that we offer, in e-diplomacy are Tech at State, this quarterly conference on the convergence of technology, foreign policy, and development. And the other is Diplopedia, built on MediaWiki. And you'll get a chance tomorrow morning to hear from Tiffany Smith and Chris Bronk, who will be talking about that as part of the Tech at State um, track. I also wanted to give a shout out to Tim Hayes, who has been curating these Tech at States, and I think he's still over at the Marvin Center checking people in, but Tim has been a huge driver in making this uh, collaboration possible. But really, my goal here is to bring the words of our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Secretary of State would, would have loved to have been here, but unfortunately is traveling, and she did pen a letter that she asked me to share with you, and we will scan the signed letter and, and make it available, obviously, on, on uh, the Wiki website. So here goes. Dear friends, on behalf of the U.S. Department of State, I am delighted to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the opening of Wikimania 2012 and the tech at state, wiki.gov. I commend each of you for your dedication to enhancing global understanding through the many projects and initiatives that the Wikimedia Foundation supports. Wikimania 2012 highlights the intersection of government and community goals. 
It demonstrates how we are breaking down the barriers between governments and the citizens they serve by making readily available critical information that is often difficult to find. The U.S. Department of State supports these endeavors in technology, knowledge sharing, and community building as they are important pillars of our 21st century statecraft agenda. I am a staunch advocate of bringing technology and knowledge to citizens around the world. And I believe it is vitally important that our diplomats understand the huge potential of using connection technologies as a way to reach foreign audiences. The world is more connected now than ever before, but there is still much work to be done to fully capitalize on the potential of this interconnection. There are many people who are disenfranchised because they lack access to information. There are others whose contribution would make our collective knowledge richer, but they face risks and difficulties in doing so. Your work in the Wikimedia Foundation contributes greatly to achieving our shared goal of making information more open and accessible. Thank you for your efforts, and please know you have my best wishes for a productive and enjoyable Wikimania 2012. With appreciation and best regards, I am sincerely yours, signed Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you. Now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for Wikimania 2012, Mary Gardner. Uh, she is an open source developer, computer science graduate student, and women in open source advocate with over 10 years of experience. Mary's research is in lexical semantics and concentrates on how changes in word choice can affect meaning and tone. Before entering graduate school, she worked as a senior software engineer for a year and contributed code to the Python-based Twisted project. In 2011, she co-founded the Ada Initiative, supporting women in open technology culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Gardner. Good morning, Wikimanians. Good morning, Tech at State attendees. Good morning. <laughs> So as interesting as computational lexical semantics and uh, computational sentiment analysis are, I'm not going to talk about my PhD work today. I'm talking about my new project, uh, work with my new project, the Ada Initiative, which is a US-based nonprofit supporting women in open technology and culture, which very much includes wiki projects and other open knowledge projects, also open source, remix culture, uh, open government, open data projects, and similar. And what I'm going to talk about specifically is fostering diversity in these kind of projects broadly, uh, not only the gender diversity, but diversity across ec different economic backgrounds, different geographic origins, different ethnic origins, and so on. Uh, so I subtitled my talk, maybe in a, in a slightly inflammatory way, uh, I wrote, uh, not a boring chore, a critical opportunity, because there can be this temptation, uh, hopefully not succumb to too much within this room, uh, to view diversity as essentially a, a PR exercise that uh, a more diverse project looks better. Uh, uh, it is, however, of course, crucial in a, uh, in a project with a mission like that of Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects to uh, encompass in, in, uh, some in the case of Wikipedia, an encyclopedia covering the, um, the, to, the sum of human knowledge, ultimately. Uh, obviously, to incorporate the sum of human knowledge, you need to incorporate the sum of humans in, in some crucial way. So it, it should be fairly obvious that, uh, therefore, diversity is one of the key goals of uh, Wikimedia Project. Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to, to uh, talk a little bit about wiki projects as social change. Uh, it's not what everyone involved in uh, wiki projects is aiming for. Uh, I mean, you, there are different reasons that you want to build the sum of human knowledge, and creating social change is only one of them. Uh, but it is something that happens as we build these projects and make them freely available that things change both because of the project and um, 
up and uh, with the momentum of the project. Uh, so just quit, uh, as a very narrow example, uh, this is from Joseph Regal's keynote last year. Uh, he mentioned the Aardwolf article back in 2001 on Wikipedia, uh, back when um, each Wikipedia title had to contain at least two capital letters, which is why it's Aardwolf with a um, capital F, uh, and South Africa. Um, yes, still it has a, has a, a terminal A and so forth. Uh, anyway, so uh, apparently the article read in total uh, Ardwolf, small animal from South Africa related to the hyena lives in the ground, nocturnal hunter. And now you have the typical Wikipedia um, zoological article with uh, zoological classification, behavior characteristics, geographic distribution, and so on. So, okay, that's not social change, that's Wikipedia changing. Um, we're stepping out to one particular individual. Uh, that, that's me when I was, I was 14 years old. Uh, the reason this is not the most flattering photo of me at 14 years old, even, I was pretty sort of awkward and gawky and so on, but it's not the most flattering photo, and the reason is that I asked my father to scan these, and this was the most flattering photo of the ones he sent. Ah. <laughs> uh. So the, the Wikipedia-related point here is that, I mean, I was, I was a pretty nerdy teenager. Um, I would have been about 14. For my 14th birthday, I got a reference work for my birthday. It was the Penguin Book of Curious and Interesting Numbers. It goes from minus one up to Graham's number, skipping some numbers in between. Uh, and I read it in numerical order. Um, and look, this is a person who really needed Wikipedia, and it, but it didn't exist. Uh, Okay, so now, um, that person, uh, when I wrote these slides, these were the last 15 or so Wikipedia pages that showed up in my browser history, skipping all the articles I read on individual members of the Beatles, because that wouldn't have been you know, very interesting. <laughs> um, so, you know, okay, so that's not social, I mean, that's social change in that it affected me, but uh, it's important to note that, like, you know, I am um, in my early 30s, I've been taken from this thing of you know having my one book, my one precious book of numbers that you know I, I read to death, uh, through to being able to read about colorectal cancer and T-Mobile USA in the same two-day period. Okay. Uh, again, social change that Wikipedians are very familiar with. In 1990, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica sold, that had their highest sales volume before or since of 120,000 printed copies of the encyclopedia. I never had one. I spent most of my, maybe not when I was 14, but I spent most of my preteen years wishing that I did. Okay, well, a couple of years ago, as you know, uh, they sold around 8,500 copies and they closed their printed edition down, but they did report that they had 450 million visits to their website. That does include the Merriam-Webster uh, Dictionary. Uh, way back in, uh, in 2006, practically prehistory, 18% uh, of the world's population was using the internet. Only 3% of, the, of the, two, the two continents listed here are the, the two smallest percentages reported on that Wikipedia page that I'm using as a, as a reference. I'm told you're not meant to do that. I'm not sure if that's true in this crowd. 3% um, of the African population using the internet and 11% of the Asia Pacific population using the internet. Okay, again, using Wikipedia as a reference. Uh, 35% of the world's population using the internet, 13% of the African population, a four times increase, 27% uh, of the Asian Pacific population more than doubled using the internet. So here we have real social change. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica has gone away, and 35% of the world's population is using the internet. So this is the kind of story that, as you know, Wikimedia projects are part of. The mooted, at least, death of print, uh, open access, ebooks, and uh, ultimately the internet. Okay, so we get to the topic of diversity uh, and how that relates. So, the good news with Wikipedia uh, is that, you know, uh, as internet projects go, it, it's, it's Definitely a very diverse project along many dimensions. Uh, at the end of May, there were 285 Wikipedias, four of them had over a million articles, 40, including the print that four. Um, English, German, French, and Dutch, I think, are the four. 
uh, have 100,000 articles, 112 have at least 10,000 articles. So that's 112 different languages you can read 10,000 articles about human knowledge in. Uh, that's, that's extremely diverse. Uh, there are, of course, um, uh, somewhere between, it depends how what you define as a language, somewhere between 8,000, uh, 3,000 and 8,000 languages spoken worldwide, of which the vast majority have no written form, but maybe ultimately that won't stop Wikimedia projects. Um, but I'm not, I'm, not here to, I'm not here today to argue that there's a, a linguistic diversity problem, at least uh, with, uh, comp as compared to your competitors. Okay, again, some figures from the Wikipedia survey of 2010 of editors and contributors. Uh, the pie chart shows every country that co uh, constituted more than 1% of respondents. A uh, great number of diverse countries represented here. Poland, the Czech Republic, China, uh, uh, the USA, Russia, and so on. India is in there, although uh, as a share of its world population, it's vastly underrepresented. Okay, the less good news, again, as many people here will know, is that uh, about a third of Wikipedia readers who responded to this survey reported being women. And the even less good news is that less than, uh, slightly less than a tenth of the editors reported being women, despite women comprising 51% of the world's population. Uh, which, you know, one is inclined to, to suspect that there is a link, that if women are not using Wikipedia, if they're not finding it useful in the same numbers that men do, they find it even less uh, interesting to contribute to. Uh, so in addition to other factors, the usefulness and representation, uh, representativeness of the knowledge contained within Wikimedia projects uh, will affect the uh, willingness of diverse people to contribute to them. Okay, so having made this argument that Wikimania, uh, sorry, Wikimedia projects are a, a part of social change, uh, whether or not uh, Wikimedia projects are always intending to drive social change, they are in some way part of social change and sometimes they are intending to be part of driving social change and giving people like my 14 year old self info, more information about colorectal cancer. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the general principles of diversity. So if you want to increase diversity in a project, why do you want to do that? And then a little bit about how. Okay, so there's a term used a little bit in some of the literature about instrumental diversity in particular. So instrumental diversity is essentially in this context the question of how can diverse participation make Wikimedia projects better? So the argument would be that we have you know, people, people with different perspectives, different knowledges coming in, their, their knowledge might make Wikipedia more comprehensive, more representative and so on. Okay, that's instrumental because you're primarily arguing for diversity in order to benefit Wikipedia rather than the other way around. And you can argue the other way around that a more representative Wikimedia project uh, with knowledge that's relevant to more people will benefit those people. Uh, so at the extreme end, the instrumental argument is sort of the PR argument, you know, it makes us sort of like, that is one of the instrumental arguments. It makes us look better to have diversity and so that will assist us, but also, you know, it makes the, pro the actual product better. And you have to balance these arguments. You can't think entirely in terms of instrumental diversity because it's not fair to the people who you are asking to give to you. Uh, there has to be an exchange where uh, in order to ask people to make the Wikimedia project's better, uh, there has to be some way that the Wikimedia projects are planning to make uh, to serve those people. Oh, yes, all right. So we have here one of the slightly more difficult uh, things to accept about diversity. So this slogan, nothing about us without us, comes out of the disability activism community, which in turn, uh, I believe, adopted it from the, uh, the foreign affairs community, actually. Um, and so what this is, is essentially uh, that you cannot dictate to people with a particular interest. You cannot tell women, you cannot tell people from different ethnic backgrounds and so on, look, this is how we're making things better for you. You know, th this is for your good, we have done this. If you choose not to accept it, then you are being ungrateful and diversity is no longer our problem, it is yours. 
So this is difficult, right, because you have, you have sort of a vicious cycle, like, well, you don't have any people of such, you know, from a certain background participating, um, but then there's nobody to ask how they can participate, so you, like, then you, you can end up sort of spinning your wheels. Uh, so the question then is outreach, that you simply you have to identify diversity failings and you have to reach out to people uh, and essentially um, keep the project, keep the discussions open to criticism which says, you know, this would make it easier for me to participate. This would make it beneficial for me to participate. Uh, constantly asking, constantly listening to the responses and believing them. Okay. So, uh, talking uh, just quickly a little more about the rationale for diversity. Um, in the Western philosophical, the liberal philosophical tradition, the traditional argument is that it promotes oneness and harmony, essentially, that, that as people talk more, uh, we will converge on one point of view uh, and converge on perhaps one culture and, and one way of thinking. Uh, as I expect you know, that's not a very popular view at present. Uh, a more uh, contemporary argument is that uh, it enables all people to change and grow, to integrate, that contact between diverse peoples allows them to borrow from each other uh, while continuing to maintain some of their differences, both in points of view and in cultural traditions and so on. Uh, so very quickly, an example of this um, discussed by uh, Peter Emberley in a 2011 book chapter is two uh, Indian art cultures that are both affiliated with religious practice. Uh, the uh, Dokra of uh, India are uh, sculptors, uh, traditionally, uh, sculpting divine forms. Uh, and Emberley argues that as they have had more contact with Western culture in particular, that their art forms, especially in the younger year, uh, in the younger artists, while continuing to maintain um, uh, artist-driven, culture-driven um, integrity to themselves, you know, moving uh, away from divine forms to secular forms, moving into sometimes 2D representations rather than 3D representations, but at the same time not moving towards actually producing Western art. Uh, likewise, the Boer people, uh, who, um, who are Bengali, uh, I, um, um, musicians, uh, and in Emberley argues, in their uh, in, in the music produced by their younger people now, uh, there's starting to move again towards some representation of uh, less eternal, more, um, more ephemeral aspects of human experience. They're also utilizing things like musical notation, musical recordings, anthropological recordings of their own culture in order to maintain it, but at the same time, viewing themselves as continuing in their own traditions, uh, integrating the aspects of Western modernity that they can use, but without moving their music towards, uh, towards a more mainstream Indian or a, a, a more Anglo style of music, um, but allowing them to access the audience uh, through modern means. So in terms of Wikimedia projects, you may have this same effect where Part of the, the contribution of Wikimedia projects in documenting the sum of human knowledge is allowing people to preserve their own traditions and ways of thinking for themselves, uh, rather than necessarily only benefiting me as a person who wants to learn more about Indian art. Okay, I wanted to talk, so one of the questions, this has been very abstract so far, you're like, okay, well, what do we do if we want to recruit diverse peoples? Uh, and I just wanted to, to talk about some general principles there. Uh, the first is, so Sue Gardner has mentioned this, I believe, in, in sort of conversations of various things. It's, uh, it, the, the power of invitation is, is one way of talking about it. So there's a story about this that I know really fairly well. In 2006, the Gnome Free Desktop Project, uh, they ran Google Summer of Code. So it's a, it's a programming project. They wanted to, the Google Summer of Code invites university students to spend their summer working on the project. Um, with a, uh, paid with a stipend. They got 200-ish applications and there were zero from women, you know, zero with an O. Um, they, so two GNOME developers, Chris Ball and Hannah Wallach, um, 
created what they called the No Women's Outreach Project, which was almost, except they paid slightly less money, almost identical to the Google Summer of Code, except that it was the No Women's Outreach Project. They received 186 applications, I believe, all of them from women. Uh, and then there was some question about, okay, why didn't they apply for the, the, the other one, which was the same, except for paying slightly more money and, and maybe being more prestigious in that you were selected from a wider field. Um, and the answer seems to be somewhere between two things. So you have a picture of your, your, a woman computing student, you have a picture of, you read a thing that says spend your summer working on a coding project. You have a picture in your head that is not necessarily of you uh, working all summer on a coding project. It's usually of that guy, like that guy. Um, the, the one who you think of as spending all his time in front of a computer. Um, and so by saying four women, like the picture automatically changes. Like, well, you know, I'm the woman in my classes who spends all the front of the time in front of the computer. Uh, the other thing, though, is that they discovered that other women were really, really keen, other computer science professors in this case, women who teach computer science, were really keen to do outreach for them once they had explicitly said that this was for women, it welcomed women, it was ordered to promote women. Women computer scientists, um, you know, were fordient to each other and, you know, some of them encouraged 10 or 15 of their own students to apply. So you had this double effect of, of um, encouraging people who specifically, tapping into networks of people who specifically want to mentor women, say, oh, okay, well, this is for us and, and I have set up a network waiting to give women opportunities and, and here's a woman opportunity coming along. So you have this double thing with the power of invitation. The second one is simply reaching out to groups. Uh, what that means is you find, you know, um, more than one, it, to give it, women as an example again, you invite one woman into your uh, editor-thon or into your hack fest and so on, uh, and then suddenly she's the woman. There's some statistical figure, it's around about 20 or 30 percent, where women stop sort of feeling like the woman. They stop feeling like everything they will do is a, you know, will be read as a, well, she only says that because she's a woman, or she does that because she's a woman, or we ask her opinion about women. Um, if you can bring in more than one person at a time by identifying existing groups of diverse people, that reduces that effect. Okay. The final thing is when you're, when you're, once you have recruited diverse people, there's this tendency to say, okay, say I identify as a woman Wikipedia editor. Actually, I do, I do edit Wikipedia, so, um, you know. There's a tendency to believe that the two identities are in conflict, that the more I identify as a, a woman Wikipedia, it becomes like this, like, woman Wikipedia editor. Um, and that the only way to get me to identify as a Wikipedia editor is to, to discourage my woman identification, so like a woman Wikipedia editor. Um, now that's not actually true. Uh, it's, it, identity is not a zero-sum game like that. It turns out that the more you encourage people to retain parts of their identity that are, that are important to them, in my case being a woman is important to me in that way, uh, to, to retain and, and um, enhance my uh, ability to continue identifying as a woman, it also increases my identification as a Wikipedia editor. Uh, so you get this kind of false problem sometimes. People, uh, people will argue that, oh well, you know, having, c c having you know, the, the, the groups for women or the groups for diverse participants and so on discourages them, like it's a, it, you know, an isolationist kind of thing. It actually encourages both identities. So that's a very important principle of diversity too, that you allow people to, uh, to acknowledge that they are part of a minority within a larger culture and to um, embrace being part of a minority within a larger culture. Okay, to conclude my talk, I wanted to just give a couple of specific examples of, uh, of possible outreach avenues for diversity. Um, not to, uh, not to say, of course, uh, I, I've had the pleasure of meeting people over the last week who, who work with Wikimedia on diversity and outreach, um, and outreach to different groups and, and educational, uh, educational projects and so on. So not to say that, that none of this has occurred to anyone in the room, but a couple of examples of ways that outreach can happen. Um, so the first is an example of primarily uh, technological outreach, which I didn't really expect. 
Um, I talked a little bit to Andy Gunn of the Open Technology Institute, who, uh, which the Open Technology Institute is in turn a part of the Detroit Digital, um, Co uh, Digital Justice Coalition here in the United States, uh, working with people in Detroit, in particular uh, non-white people who are young, um, building up communication uh, and access to media and technology. All right, so their, so their overall mission statement is that um, people and organizations in Detroit want to believe that communication, uh, who believe, sorry, that communication is a fundamental human right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and it's, so these are, this is an excerpt from, they have the principles of digital justice on their webpage, it's quite long. Uh, you know, there, there are about maybe 15 or 20 principles. I recommend having a look at their webpage for all of them. Uh, but you'll notice I've just got an excerpt here, equal access to media and technology as producers as well as consumers, uh, prioritizing the participation of people who've been traditionally excluded, uh, advancing our ability to tell our own stories, again referring to people who've been traditionally excluded, and the creation of knowledge tools and technologies that are free and shared. Now, points one and four in particular are very compatible with the, the broader open movement, open access, open knowledge, wiki culture, and so on. Um, and points two and three relate more to, uh, to diversity concerns. Anyway, so I emailed them, uh, and Andy, uh, what immediately leapt to mind, actually, was uh, technological outreach, that he sees the problem with, uh, the first problem with getting his community to participate in Wikimedia projects is technological. Uh, so they're very focused on mesh networking, community neighborhood mesh networking, where you set up, you know, ad hoc wireless networks that have a flaky, or, uh, not always on, expensive, slow uplink to the internet, um, and primarily exchange information within your mesh network. Uh, and so what he said is, okay, well, in order to, for Wikipedia to be useful, um, we would need to be able to cache it uh, for, for locals to use, which of course is possible under the license. Um, but uh, it, it you know, uh, wasn't, in fact, immediately obvious to him how they, that there was just something that you could actually now download onto, a, onto their server and that there are no further obstacles uh, to, to a local cache of, of Wikipedia and that you all of you could just create one right now. Uh, so that's a sort of a form of educational outreach, like having this thing like, um, that it, it becomes more important to say very explicitly, here's how you would cache Wikipedia. Here's how you make a copy of Wikipedia for your local community. Uh, not that just that you could if you wanted to, but here it is bundled up for you. Reach out and take it, please. Secondly, he suggested distributing edit, uh, distributed editing. Now, as um, you have heard, my background is in computer science, so I fully appreciate how difficult distributed editing, uh, re resolving all of the conflicts once all the different dist dist uh, distributed edit edits come online. Um, you know, and then you have you know, 15 way mergers, and I can't imagine what the talk pages look like. Um, it's a very difficult technological problem, but nevertheless, it, it's something that they listed. Look, you know, our people would want to be able to edit Wikipedia in real time in their neighborhoods um, when they don't have an uplink. Uh, so you, I, I can't tell you how to solve the technological problems involved, but I, I'm not actually sure whether it's a, um, even in theory a, a computationally tractable problem, but nevertheless, once you ask people, this is something that they say. How can we edit Wikipedia offline? Um, and finally, more broadly, education about Wikipedia and contributing to it so that there would be outreach to their community, to their educators, and their educators would modify the material in order to pass it on to people in their community in a way that works best for, uh, for people in that community. Um, so yeah, so, so in terms of concrete steps, some of them are technological is, is uh, the argument I'm making here. I think this clicker may have a randomizer in it. You know, like <laughs> when you get the pigeons and the, that pigeon experiment where you just randomly feed them and they get superstitious. They develop, you know, they develop, they, they think that because they spun in a circle and then food dropped out that there's some causal connection. There really is no causal connection between me pressing this button and the slide advancing. <laughs> okay. 
The, um, the, the second type of, uh, type of outreach I wanted to talk about quickly, and again, you know, uh, to, to put it crudely maybe, I don't want to teach the Wikimedia Foundation how to suck eggs. Um, uh, organizational outreach. So uh, the, point, the point I'm trying to make here is that you can be tempted in a, especially in a sort of a, um, individually created project uh, like some of the Wikimedia projects where you prim a lot of people primarily um, identify as an individual rather than a member of a group contributing, that uh, the responsibility for diversity is evenly spread across every contributor to Wikipedia, meaning that everybody ends up with a teeny tiny responsibility towards diversity and nothing gets done. Um, instead, you, you utilize the groups you have created, including, the, including but not only the foundation, and push up to them, look, this is too much work for one person, make a team. All right. So an example I just wanted to quickly talk about here, there's the GenderLinks project is a large non-government organization in Southern Africa uh, based, uh, so this is a, again their, their statement, they're, they're working to promote gender equity in Southern Africa. Um, now what they already do, again with the, uh, someone is actually experimenting on me I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, this kind of problem, uh, so uh, you know, this is not unique to Southern Africa. The, the problem is that when the news media cites sources, uh, even though women comprise 51% of the population in Southern Africa, black women comprise 41% of the population, they appear very, very disproportionately small as you know, people quoted in articles or sources of information that journalists use. Uh, and so one of, one of the many projects that Gender Links works on is, is trying to fix this situation. But uh, one of the important things to note, so they've, they, this is some of the areas they work in, HIV, uh, because there's a lot of reporting on HIV in the media of Southern Africa. Um, business, uh, and the reason they emphasize business is in fact that a great deal of the, of the economy in the region is driven by small women-owned businesses. But when economics writers write about the local economy, it tends to be focused on very large corporations and disproportionately male sources who run very large organizations. Um, sports reporting, uh, you know, increasing the, the representation of women's sporting and so on. Uh, but an interesting thing, while they do do media literature training, as I mentioned here, we, uh, media literacy training, which uh, improves the ability of people to interact with the media, um, both, you know, how to talk to the media, how to use the media for your purposes to promote your message and how to understand the messages coming in and what the biases might be and what an appropriate source is and so on. They also, uh, rather than trying to bring the public to the journalists, do a lot of work on bringing the journalists to the public, a lot of work on reaching out to journalists as the people with the power to change, and journalists and editors, the people with the power to actually change the news media um, most directly, educating them on how best to come to the community. Uh, so the point with this is that um, there's a great role for uh, organizational conversations between the Wikimedia community, not only the foundation, but the, the community of people involved in the projects, um, and organizations who are accustomed to bringing the powerful to the needs of the powerless, uh, like the Gender Links organization, among many other examples. Because ultimately, in the context of, uh, of this, kind, especially of global diversity um, and uh, economically less privileged people, it's really the Wikimedia community that has the power that needs to come to um, come to be the uh, come to the people who cannot reach it, rather than the other way around. Uh, even, even if you sit there with a with an open door, it's, you know you actually need to visage it more as a journey and then, you know, towards. Okay, so that was some of the, some of the specific idea, um, types of organizational outreach that are effective here are reaching out to cultural preservation groups who are interested in documenting and continuing their own culture, reach, um, and I know of that the Wikimedia Foundation has a strong history of reaching out to, to glam communities for precisely this reason. Uh, to media literacy and education groups because they're accustomed in, to bridging communication gaps between relatively powerful writing groups and uh, less powerful people who can't participate in them well. 
um, to digital education groups like the Digital Justice Coalition and NGOs and nonprofits in general. All right. So in summary, what I've talked about is essentially an introduction to diversity, arguing that um, as a project of social change, a project that is at least part of social change, even if, um, even if it's not an activist project um, uh, in terms of creating social change outside of the internet, the Wikimedia community has a responsibility to both to its mission and to people out there in the world to always be on a journey towards diversity. Uh, and that diversity does not look like bringing everyone inside the tent and getting them to agree that the current way of thinking, the current uh, one cultural tradition or one way um, of thinking is the best way, but to increase the size of the umbrella, as it were. Uh, and I've suggested some specific ways that uh, that, that can be done. Good morning, my name is Rebecca Taylor and I'm a computer scientist serving at the State Department. So there are a few of us running around inside the building that uh, have written code. Um, yep. I had a uh, very specific question. I don't know how many people in the audience know who Ada was. <sighs> uh, right, so um, the Ada Initiative is named for uh, Ada Lovelace, who was Lord Byron's daughter. Uh, now, Charles Babbage invented the difference engine and, um, and designed the analytical engine uh, in the 19th century. And uh, Lady Lovelace had been trained by her tutors her mother had hired. As Lord Byron's daughter, her mother was very keen that she not be infected with poetry. That um, it, was a, it was a dangerous and debauched profession and that mathematics would be the correct antidote. So she received a very strong mathematical education. Uh, she met Babbage at, um, I believe, one of Mary Somerville's parties. Mary Somerville was herself a major figure in, um, in the British science community at the time as a, um, as a hostess and um, also an a, a increaser of scientific knowledge. Um, they met at the party, uh, there was significant correspondence between them, uh, and partly as a result, Ada Lovelace is regarded as the world's first computer programmer because of um, some of her writings about how the difference in analytical engines can be used, which amount to computer programming. Anyway, so we named ourselves the, uh, the, um, the Ada Initiative after her. In, in America, a lot of people think it's the, American, uh, the ADA, the Disability Act, um, in Australia, it's a little more unambiguous. Uh, someone in the middle, maybe? Oh, uh, yeah, there's a hand there. Um, what inspired you to create the, uh, in the ADA initiative? Um, was there a specific moment that inspired you to do that? Uh, well, actually, it's the, the, uh, what inspired uh, my co-founder to found the Ada Initiative because um, the, the way I found out about it, I, 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 have, I own the initiative part of the name. She insisted on the Ada Lovelace part of the name, but uh, before, before it had a name, I received an email from Val saying, um, you know, uh, it's, it's time that we got paid to do this kind of advocacy, essentially, and that we raise money as a nonprofit and, and create full-time advocates rather than part-time advocates. Uh, there were, in 2009, in, so we had that discussion in 2010. Starting in 2009, there were a lot of discussions in the open source community in particular about um, that the, uh, the participation of women in open source wasn't just a problem of um, of women's socialization wasn't just a problem of, of um, you know, uh, the, the hacker norms maybe being a little more alien to women, but was also a problem of active discrimination against women in the form of, uh, in particular, we focused on, on sexual harassment in the, um, the open source community. So what inspired us ultimately was this realization that there are acti actually concrete bad things happening to women in some open communities, but also, you know, um, 
These are more immediate problems. Fixing the socialization of women is actually quite a hard problem. Convincing people that when women attend a conference that you should not uh, constantly proposition them for sex is actually, it's actually an easier problem. Um, so, so in a way, the, the fact that there was this easier, uh, you know, th this immediate problem to be solved gave us focus and that's why we created the organization. Uh, anyone from this side of the room? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can hear you, I'll repeat oh, okay. the question. Uh, sorry about that. We have a question from Twitter. Why is Pinterest hugely popular with women, but Wikipedia is not as much? I think that's, that, that, that's actually a really bad question for me because I use Wikipedia and I don't use Pinterest. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Repeating the question, uh, why, why is Pinterest um, hugely popular with women and, uh, and why is Wikipedia much less popular with women? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I'm the wrong person to answer that question. I'm also not on Facebook. So, <laughs> kind of a... This is, a, this is part of the problem, actually, with diversity. You know, if you, if you bring someone like me into Wikipedia, you know, I'm not that diverse in terms of the Wikipedia community. You know, I've nearly finished a PhD in computer science. Um, I have a, a strong undergraduate education and so forth, very kind of demographically typical in many ways. You are, and you ask me what women want from Wikipedia, all I can tell you is to, is to keep asking other women who aren't already here. <sighs> Yeah, so I, so I apologize to the person on Twitter who, who asked that question because I, I'm not best placed to answer it. Um, uh, back to this side of the room, if we've got someone. Um, hi, uh, my name's Jared. I, I work uh, at the, I'm basically the senior engineer for the Voting Information Project, mm -hmm. and we are hiring an engineer. Uh, we have not had many women apply for the position. Uh, is there something that we can do with the language of the application or the job description? Uh, how do we actually encourage more people to just even apply? Okay, encouraging women to apply for, for um, you know, stereotypically male jobs like engineering positions. Uh, there's a few things, so I won't sort of go into a, into a long list. One of the Ada Initiative's projects, I should say, is actually developing a, like a, a series of resources that answer this question, how to write your job ad, where to place it, so that women will see it and so on. We haven't done that yet, but a few quick answers. Uh, one, is a, one is a negative rec recommendation, avoid, you know, ninja, rock star, um, beer parties, pool tables. Um, like, not saying that, that, uh, that the women who apply won't like being ninjas, playing pool, or, or being rock stars, but it, it, it does code that, that you're looking for a particular, that you've got a picture in your head and that picture is, is not me. Um, I don't, I'm an, I, and I'm bad at pool. Um, so, that, so that's the negative recommendation. The positive one, uh, it might actually be better to come and see me at some point during the conference because we are starting to develop a list of places where you can advertise your jobs where women congregate. Um, for Linux jobs, for example, there's still the, the Linux Chicks group, which is global. They have a mailing list where you send jobs to. Now, it won't guarantee that women will apply and you may not ultimately be able to get women to apply. But we do have a list of places you can advertise so that you know that you've at least tried. Um, so and if, if other people would like to have that same question and want to see me during the conference, you know, feel free. And also Valerie, um, who's not on stage, but she has pink hair. <laughs> All right, uh, anyone from the middle? Um, uh, microphone's coming, sorry. Microphone behind you? Uh, my name is Kristen. Could you say a little more about language revitalization, native and aboriginal languages and the spoken languages as part of diversity? It's a pretty broad question and I'm not an academic expert in revitalizing languages. Um, so the, the typical argument for doing it is that um, 
languages, uh, there's some, uh, it's referred to as the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, and the strong version of it is that language forms thought. So that if you don't have a way of expressing X in your language, you cannot, literally cannot think X. No linguists actually believe that. Uh, but there is a weaker form, which is that in some ways languages influence thought. Um, that uh, a language in combination with a culture uh, makes it easier to, to continue that culture, to continue its traditions. Um, uh, and so that's one aspect of, one aspect of cultural diversity is, um, is preserving language. Another is the thing I talked about in my talk, which is that it, uh, encouraging identification with the subculture does not necessarily destroy your identification with the, the surrounding project or group. So if you encourage, um, if society encourages the preservations of la preservation of languages, um, then uh, uh, it, and strengthens people's identification narrowly with their own culture, it can also increase their sense of ease as a, as a person um, transitioning into you know, among multiple cultures. Uh, the third aspect is that it's just a gesture of goodwill. Um, a lot of very, very hostile political activity in history has taken place to suppress people's use of disfavored languages, to suppress, you know, to give, um, to give Anglo examples, to suppress the, the languages of the British Isles that are not English, to Irish Gaelic and um, Scots Gaelic and, uh, and Welsh. Um, as a, as a gesture of, of goodwill and apology and humility, allowing people to have their own languages back um, is, a, is a nice first step to some of the, the horrible repression that has happened of, of non-dominant cultures in many, many, many nation states. Um, again, it's a hugely broad question. I can sort of thought dump for ages, but uh, I should probably move on. But if you want to come and ask me, um, I'm guessing there are probably linguists in this audience who know more about language preservation than I do. I'm not an expert, but I'm happy to. It's an interesting topic, and we can talk after the talk. Somebody from this side? Another one from Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, how should Wikipedia change the world? Not that it hasn't already. How should Wikipedia change the world? And not that it hasn't already. Yeah, so, um, I guess continuing from my, there are a lot of ways Wikipedia should change the world. Um, but aside from giving everyone a free pony and so forth, um, I, I think the preservation of the, the allowing people to access knowledge in their own language, um, or a language in which they are most comfortable and, um, uh, and allowing the documentation of cultural and historical traditions uh, without fear or favor across, um, you know, across the, the whole breadth of human experience is, is pretty damn well changing. So I guess that would be my answer. I think there would be someone in the front who also wanted to ask a question. others, and uh, maybe even the, uh, uh, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the ways in which people communicate mm -hmm. in the typical ways over Wikipedia, how can those be altered to foster more diversity? What can a typical Wikipedian do to, to foster diversity, and then, you know, what are ways of communication um, that can foster diversity in general? I would suggest that a good first step for the average Wikipedian is, uh, and you know, I, again, I'm not saying that no Wikipedian is already doing this. Uh, I'm sure many of you are. A good first step for a Wikipedian is maybe stepping outside your comfort zone a little bit, reading some articles outside of your outside of your culture, outside of your educational background, outside of you know. Read articles about the interests of little girls if you are never a little girl. Read articles about African culture if you've never lived in Africa or been part of an African culture. Read the talk pages. Don't edit them. Um, you know, ob observe how things are done. Uh, check out, you know, just sort of measure, to keep in mind in your head, you know, is, is this one quite as long as the article about Teenage Ninja Turtles? And if not, why, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Uh, if not, why not? Just start asking those questions. Um, and so I think like, it, it takes a while to actually come to talking to people. You have to do a lot of, of reading, a lot of um, a, a thinking of your own first. So that, that is actually what I'd suggest. Uh, 
In terms of communication styles, um, assume good faith, which I, is, a, is a Wikipedia um, axiom. Assume, assume good faith is a good one. Uh, the next step, I think, after that is if somebody, if somebody says you are damaged, uh, um, in particular somebody from an, uh, if you happen to know that they're from an underrepresented group or trying to improve uh, representation of an underrepresented topic and so on, if somebody says you are hurting them and stopping them from doing that, listen. And don't, uh, it, it, it's very easy to be defensive. Um, everyone, everyone feels that I, you know, um, we, had, we had a feedback set. We ran an Ada camp for women, um, or mostly women, in the two weeks, uh, two days before this. And we had a feedback session at the end. We were like, okay, how can we make this better? Oh, you know, like it's bad to sit there and listen to that. And like, you know, uh, for example, they complained that there wasn't a mi wireless microphone. You're like, do you know how hard we worked? <laughs> and so, so you know, I I, I recognise that tendency to be like, you know, oh, you're you're hurting my ability to represent my culture in Wikipedia. Do you know how I'm hard I'm working to make that not true? Um, that you know, if you know, but instead, ultimately, what you have to do is is is. That your first response should be to believe them. That you know, if uh, and and listen to what they say. They say, look, you are, you know, if they won't probably phrase it as you are hurting my. But um, if the discussion is becoming unproductive for them, try and figure out how to change it. And if and if you can't figure out how to change it, withdraw from the conversation. Um, okay, sorry. So um, I'm told this is the last question. Okay, but but it's a good last question. So. It's, it's, it's hard to be told that the first thing to do is to shut up and listen, but the first thing to do is to shut up and listen. And I would just like to very quickly thank uh, uh, the uh, Wikimania organizers for inviting me to keynote the conference. I'm very honored. Uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting many people uh, throughout the week and talking more about the Ada Initiative and about Wikimedia projects. Thank you, Mary, for uh, delivering the keynote address to Wikimania. It was an honor having you here. And now, a brief presentation on behalf of the Wikimedia Storytellers. Here's Victor Grigas. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Victor. I'm a storyteller at the Wikimedia Foundation in San Francisco. Uh, so in 2005, I was a film student at Columbia College, Chicago. I was in the computer lab, and I was researching a paper. And all my Google searches kept coming up with this website that gave me all this junk. Uh, I had I do a Google search, and it would have one sentence summaries of everything, or paragraph summaries of everything. And I thought this was really annoying. Uh, I hated it. And I saw uh, in the corner it said, you can edit this. I said, OK. I clicked edit. And then uh, I wrote some junk in there, pressed save. I'm like, ha ha, OK, I did it. Uh, I got my revenge. And then 10 minutes later, it was reverted. And I'm like, OK, so this, this is kind of weird. What, what just happened? And then, so I did it again. And then, <laughs> uh, and then it happened again. And I'm like, oh my god, Wikipedia is invincible. <laughs> so I saw, I saw this, and I, I was totally hooked after that. So I started writing about things I cared about, like uh, Chicago, where I'm from, uh, graffiti, which was an enthusiasm of mine. Uh, and then, uh, so fast forward to 2011, I started uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation in San Francisco. Uh, and basically my job is to put a face on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it's really, really, really easy to see cold text on a screen and have no idea where it comes from. Uh, and so there's all these misconceptions people have in the world. People think that Julian Assange runs Wikipedia. Uh, 
people think that there's 100,000 paid academics somewhere in these you know, huge towers somewhere who must be curating this thing. When you tell them it's open source, anyone can edit, well, who's, who's policing this? How does this work? People just have no clue how this thing works and that it's made by volunteers and it's made how it is. Uh, so uh, uh, last year in 2011, you may have seen some of the uh, banners uh, the fundraiser, uh, which is technically the team I work with, is a fantastic way to show that face. Who is Wikipedia? And so uh, this year we're going to be doing that as well. Uh, we're going to be doing it more extensively, but we're also going to be doing something different. The goal this year is to have a video, to start the fundraiser with a video that explains what is Wikipedia, who makes it, uh, in the voice of the people who make it. So uh, what we have here, can everybody who's on the team here stand up uh, if you're here? I don't know who's here. This is, I see Bryony over here. But here we got some more people over here. So these are the people uh, you can talk to if you want to share your story with our team. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's see here. We have a booth on the uh, third floor of the Continental Ballroom in the Marvin Center. Uh, you can sign up to tell your story. Uh, the video that we're expecting to produce, we have, uh, it's going to be rough, the idea is that it's about roughly two minutes and we're going to start the fundraiser this year with that. So uh, if you have any other questions or anything else, please come to our booth, uh, sign up. We're also going to be doing uh, audio interviews if you don't want to be on video or anything like that. So uh, thank you for your time and I hope you will share your story with us. Everybody has a totally different reason for being involved and it's really interesting to talk to everybody and find out why they're involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. May you receive several stories of Wikipedia's invincibility. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, the founder of Wikipedia, Mr. Jimmy Wales. Thank you. Uh, very good. Well, this is always, every year, this is my most difficult speech. I make speeches um, all over the world all the time, of course, but this is the one speech uh, where I'm absolutely certain that everyone in the audience knows more than I do about Wikipedia. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'll try to share a few uh, thoughts and things that I've learned. Um, and uh, what did Mary taught us? You, you have to spin in a circle and then click. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for your presentation uh, about the Avia Initiative. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this year, uh, for the first time ever, I'm going to have to leave uh, Wikimania a bit early. Uh, and one of the reasons is because I've been working on my own uh, Ada Initiative, uh, Baby Ada. Uh, so I named my, uh, well I didn't, uh, my partner and I named our daughter uh, Ada after Ada Countess of Lovelace uh, because uh, I think she'll someday make a really great Wikipedia. Uh, the only evidence I have for this so far is that I have actually seen her throw down chocolate to lunge for the iPad. <laughs> so I'm, I'm optimistic here. Uh, so moving forward. Uh, so I, I wanted to talk about Wikimania so far. Uh, this is an incredible uh, conference and uh, we're just gonna raise hands for this part because I'm gonna make you stand up in a minute. Uh, I'm just curious to know how many of you were here for Frankfurt? Good, and who was here for Boston? Taipei, well, that's good. Alexandria, Buenos Aires, Gdansk, Haifa, yeah, fun. So lots of people have been here lots of times, uh, but then something that's become something of a little bit of a tradition, just to make sure everybody's awake. Uh, I'm gonna make you all stand up now, if we can click, how many people started editing uh, in, in 2012 or earlier. <laughs> or earlier. I.e., have you ever edited Wikipedia is really the question. And then um, you, you'll sit down one by one. How many of you started in 2011 or earlier? Oh, wow. Almost everybody. Nobody, not many people here just started this year. 2010? 
2008, wow, this is a pretty stable crowd. <laughs> 2007, oh, come on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock some of you down in a minute. 2006, 2005, there we go, now we're starting to knock a few of you down. 2004, 2003, 2002, Woo! and finally, 2001. I think there's three of us still standing. Four. So, as, um, as Victor uh, discussed uh, when he was talking about the Storyteller Project, uh, there are many misconceptions about Wikipedia and about Wikipedians. Uh, many of you have seen this uh, meme floating around the internet um, called What I Do. And uh, thanks to Guillaume of, uh, actually of uh, Wikimedia France who first uh, did one of these uh, about Wikipedia and I've modified it somewhat. I've got my own version here. So what society thinks we do, as Victor mentioned, uh, they think we work in the big cubicles. Uh, that there's a giant office building and we're just, uh, you know, beavering away, typing, typing, typing. Uh, of course, this, is, this one is actually not true. Uh, if we move to the next one, uh, what do our families think we do? I can't talk now. Someone is wrong on the internet. This one is, um, this one's actually true, at least of me. Um, so on to the next one. What Congress thinks we do. <laughs> now this is actually not quite true. This is the Incredible Hulk, of course, but we are not the Incredible Hulk. Uh, if we switch to the next slide, we'll see we, we are the Credible Hulk. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry because I always back up my rage with facts and documented sources. Um, I actually wanted to, this I think is the funniest thing I've seen on the internet in a while. I wanted to give credit for it and I spent a lot of time trying to hunt down who said this first and I couldn't figure out where this meme came from so I can't really give credit, uh, unfortunately, but it's not me. Uh, so if we go forward, what publishers think we do? Click. Uh, and then uh, what do we think we do? Click. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Scholarly scribes. Uh, and uh, in fact, what do we really do? <laughs> Revert vandalism, mostly. Uh, no, but what do we really do? If we go on here, uh, what we do is we imagine a world in which every single person is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Um, and that is our mission. Um, and so, um, what I wanted to talk about, if we can just click, uh, oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the internet uh, and the situation in Africa. Uh, and th this is really the, the actual, um, quite minimal uh, content portion of my speech. Um, this, is, this is what you know, or this is what you probably think you know. Uh, this is the most common thing. If I start to talk about the internet in Africa with people, one of the things people say is, ooh, ooh, I know, I know. Yes, people in Africa can use their mobile phone to get prices of crops so they can carry their crops to the right market and make more money. Uh, the news media loves this story, uh, but uh, this is really not uh, very accurate. Uh, it's true enough, but it really clouds the mind. If you're thinking about the internet in Africa, it's about subsistence farmers uh, getting better crop prices. You're really missing something very, very important that's going on. Uh, so what you probably don't know, although in this crowd you probably do know, some of you do anyway. Uh, so this is my phone. This is the phone that I carry. Uh, a friend of mine bought this phone for me in Kenya uh, for $80. Uh, it's an Android phone, so it has apps and has everything on it. Uh, it's, uh, the screen is uh, smaller than an iPhone. It's not quite as good as an iPhone, but it works perfectly well. Uh, unlike most phones that most people would carry in this audience, my battery actually lasts for two days. Um, so uh, let's take a look at internet usage. So just think about the $80, $80. That is not yet reaching the poorest people in the world, but compared to just a few years ago, when a phone like this couldn't exist, 
or a couple years ago when a phone like this, the only phone would have been maybe the iPhone uh, at $600, $800. Uh, when we've gotten the price down to $80 so quickly, it is having a huge impact. They've sold hundreds of thousands of these in Kenya um, already. So let's just take a look. Can we go back one slide, please? It is really random. Um, I think there's a human. I think it's very weird technology. I think when I click this, a human somewhere is notified. <laughs> and then they push it. And then, I don't know. Um, that means there's two. A pigeon is notified. No, I, <laughs> I'm the pigeon. A human is trying to interpret my twitching up on stage. So uh, I just want to look at one country, Nigeria, uh, and look at the, the rate of internet access uh, in Nigeria. Uh, in 2000, there was 0.1% of the population online. 2006, 3.1%. 2009, 61%. In 2011, uh, as of December 31st, there were 29% of people in Nigeria online. Um, when we go forward one slide. That actually seems to work better, sort of verbally discussing what's going to happen. Um, The total bandwidth into Nigeria, and this is really what's driving uh, a lot of change uh, in Nigeria, but also across Africa broadly, uh, is that the total bandwidth, a lot of new undersea cables have been laid. Uh, The bandwidth has gone from 72 megabits to 693 megabits. And by the end of 2012, they're going to have 12 terabits of connectivity uh, into Nigeria. Uh, What does this mean practically? Uh, if we click one slide forward. Uh, in my hotel this morning, I got a 2.44 megabits download, 1.28 upload. When I was in Lagos, Nigeria a few months ago, look at that, 9.3 down and 11, almost 11 and a half up. They have better up than down, it's amazing. Um, now, it is important, I tweeted about this and I got a, a fairly high number of kind of angry tweets back uh, from people in Nigeria saying, this is not realistic, this is not true. Uh, well, it's true in the sense that I was at a fancy hotel a conference had brought me to, uh, very near uh, the, the point where the cable comes in and all that. It is absolutely true that this kind of bandwidth has not yet made its way to ordinary consumers everywhere um, across Nigeria. But the fact is that there is so much bandwidth that's coming into the country, retail prices are going to drop substantially, and that number of 29% is going to reach 50% before we know it. Uh, so what impact does this have? If we click forward. Uh, Oh, well, so what are people doing online? This is actually uh, the key thing. Uh, And so what I'm really trying to to wake people up to uh, is the idea that if if you're thinking about uh, subsistence farmers doing, uh, getting crop prices and all this, you're really missing something very important. Uh, If we could just bring up each of these bullet points. Are they searching for prices for crops? Are they reporting malaria outbreaks? Uh, This is all sort of the Western mythology of what Africa is all about. Maybe, yeah, sure. I'm sure some people are doing those things, but what are they really doing? If we go to the next slide, uh, we can just load all of these bullet points, please. Um, the top sites are Google, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, uh, local newspapers. Uh, the important point to understand here is that when people in Africa get online, what do they do online? They do all of the same things everybody else does online. Uh, and that's really important to think about. The ongoing march of technology is making real and usable internet access available to tens of millions across Africa today. And a lot more is coming uh, in the near future. So what you need to know is if you think forward five to 10 years, we're gonna have massive connectivity all across uh, the entire world, including places where we normally think uh, that they're very far behind. Uh, We're gonna have massive connectivity to the real internet for hundreds of millions of people, and those people uh, do not necessarily speak English or French. Um, We're already seeing this uh, in India. There used to be the the situation in India where you could quite plausibly say, well, look, virtually everyone in India who has a computer uh, and is on the internet can speak English. That is no longer true in India. Uh, There are huge, huge numbers of people who uh, don't speak English, and that's uh, incredibly important. And one of the reasons that uh, we believe in having uh, Wikipedia in every single language. Uh, so this is our mission, of course, uh, uh, free access to some of all human knowledge uh, for every single person on the planet. Uh, clicking forward. So I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, ma- the largest languages we have in uh, the African languages. Uh, so uh, Yoruba has just passed in a great model. Is there anybody here from Nigeria, actually? No. I think we really need to change that next year. Um, 
Uh, is there anybody here from Swahili Wikipedia? I think that's probably more likely. Yes, a few, yeah. So that's really great. Uh, so the interesting thing, Yoruba has uh, about 30,000 articles. I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. I think that uh, Swahili and Afrikaans, though, anybody from Afrikaans Wikipedia? Should be, yeah. Um, Swahili and Afrikaans Wikipedia is in, an, in another sense are actually more successful than Yoruba. Uh, and I'm gonna talk more about Yoruba. Swahili and Afrikaans both have active, real, uh, live communities and are really moving forward with work. Uh, let's just talk about Yoruba though. Uh, clicking through, adding all these bullet points. Uh, Yoruba had a huge surge of articles last year. Uh, they went from, and hold on this slide, went from 15,000 to 29 or 30,000 in one month. Uh, the articles were done by a bot, um, which you might think is kind of cheating. Um, but it reminds me of Polish Wikipedia a few years back when they added a lot of articles with a bot. And of course, English Wikipedia. Uh, one of the things that people who uh, are more new to the project may not realize is that there was a point in time when English Wikipedia went from, I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like 30,000 articles to 60,000 articles uh, because uh, Ram Man wrote Rambot and um, we added uh, an article about every little village and town in the United States based on census data and so forth. Uh, that was actually really miraculous because when the project was still small, I got an email from someone and they had typed into Google and they were like, oh my God, Wikipedia must be so huge. They have this small town where I grew up with only 73 people in it. <laughs> How did you do that? Um, uh, so although you might consider it cheating, I actually think that this kind of thing, if it's uh, culturally appropriate and you're adding the right information, I don't recommend that people use Rambot to add articles about the United States in every language of the world. But as long as you've got a sensible idea for a robot, I think that it's quite valuable in a very small language Wikipedia to add a lot of articles for, uh, if nothing else, search engine optimization purposes. Uh, so just to, to conclude a little bit about Africa before I move on to the next section, uh, the story of the internet in Africa in the next 10 years is not a story about charity, it's not a story about subsistence farmers, it's not a story about SMS, uh, it's a story about normalization. It's a story about joining the global conversation. Uh, we've got tens and hundreds of millions of people who are coming online uh, for the first time, um, and they're not doing weird foreign alien things that we can think about as, oh, those poor Africans. They're doing totally normal things. They're getting on Twitter and Facebook and doing everything that we do, and I think that's incredibly, incredibly exciting. So now it's time for Jimbo's Awards. Yay. Um, so I started this uh, last year, and I hope to make it an ongoing uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, last year, uh, for the first time, I gave uh, the Wikipedian of the, war, of the Year Award uh, to uh, Ruan, who is here somewhere. Can he stand up here from Kazakh Wikipedia? Uh, and um, I offered uh, a, a donation to the Kazakh Wikipedia community, and to visit uh, Kazakhstan. Neither of those things has actually happened yet, um, but the, the offer still stands, and actually I met with the uh, ambassador uh, from Kazakhstan this morning, and uh, we're planning a trip there as soon as possible so that I can uh, give him an award in the, in the presence of the president or prime minister, whoever we can wrangle to come to that. Um, and so now, uh, for this year, uh, I'm gonna do, again, uh, the Wikipedian of the year, uh, and then after that, I'm gonna do staff member of the year, which is my new concept. So. Uh, to announce uh, the Wikimedia of the Year, it was user Demi, um, who almost no one knows because he's the sole lonely guy who's plugging away on the uh, Yoruba Wikipedia that I just spoke about. Uh, his accomplishments, and unfortunately Demi is not here today, uh, he created about 15,000 articles uh, using a bot. Uh, and the result, and this is why I think this is actually a valuable exercise, is that uh, Yoruba Wikipedia went to having uh, one to two active editors, so almost no one there, to having four to six active editors. So he's just beginning a community there. A few people are coming in, and part of the reason is they're finding things in search, and they're going, and they're finding a little thing, and they're thinking, um, as we heard today, you know, Ardwolf, one sentence, this is really crap, I should fix this. Uh, and so people start to become active. So uh, I wish that Demi were here, but he isn't. So if anybody wants to edit his page and tell him, because he has no idea, I'm gonna give him $5,000. Uh, and this time, the, the, for Ruan's award, I said I would give it to the, to the forming chapter or proto-chapter or to help with the chapter to bring together for a conference. 
Uh, in this case, there is no chapter, so I'm gonna let him decide how to use it. Um, I think perhaps uh, I will encourage him to use it to uh, help promote Wikipedia, or even, I don't know if he has a, I, I know nothing about the guy. It's a, sort of the typical Wikipedian. He's doing amazing work. I have absolutely no idea who he is. Uh, yeah, I should talk to him. That's a good idea. I left him, I left him a message on his talk page once, and he responded, so he seems like a nice guy. Anyway, um, if he has a job, I, maybe he can uh, lay off his job for a while, I don't know. Uh, but we'll see. So that's really great. So now the staff member award. Uh, this is a new award. Uh, it's very difficult to decide, um, in part because I just thought of this yesterday. Um, in true wiki fashion, I, uh, you know, be bold, uh, didn't actually put together a huge committee to do something. I just thought this sounds cool, I should do this. Uh, and so next year I think we should have some process to do it. Um, I'm going to talk to Sue and maybe uh, the staff members can select among themselves or something like that. Uh, but for this year, I made two selections. And so for the first selection, uh, I'm going to actually ask him, do not be careless with these bullet points or you'll give away the punchline. One bullet point, please. To introduce the selection, I'll ask Philippe to come up on stage. And Philippe's friend. Yes. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> this is Oliver. Uh, I have the yeah. best job in the world um, because I get to talk to contributors and readers every day. But one of the neatest things that I get to do is to uh, find interesting people in the community and, and help find cool ways for them to develop. And I've gotten to do that um, through Maggie, Moon Ridden Girl, who is M. Dennis uh, on the, the wiki. And she is the first of the two staff members of the year. So Oliver's going to go get her, if he could, um, because she's hiding somewhere over here. Um, and she is truly hiding, I'm sure. <laughs> More than 100,000 edits to the wikis, and she uh, slaves away doing work on copyright for us. So, Maggie, Moon Ridden Girl, is the first of two staff members of the year, and we're so honored. Uh, Oliver has something for her. Stand at the mic. So, um, this is a very Wikipedian compliment. It's a piece of esoteric knowledge. Um, in sort of mystical Hasidic Judaism, there's this concept of the Lamid Fav Tzedekim, which are the 36 righteous ones. And the idea is that there are these people who go around doing good deeds and in doing so hold up the world. And the crucial bit is they're so righteous, they don't even know that they're righteous because to do so would give them arrogance, which would undermine the point. Um, and when I'm dealing with Maggie, the thing that comes to mind is the idea of someone who does incredible work and keeps everything together the whole time oblivious to just how fantastic her contributions are. So it seemed like an appropriate metaphor to use. And we got her a small gift uh, inspired by her username or the other way around. Oh, beautiful. It's a poem that my username is drawn from. Ooh. So Maggie, uh, Thank you. there is one other thing that people uh, may not know, which is that today is Maggie's birthday. <laughs> Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, and, uh, great, super. Uh, so now for the, uh, so that was Maggie. We can click this now, Maggie. <laughs> so now for the second selection. I, I guess some of you may have seen the ceiling cat meme. Uh, and then I chose this slide to, to introduce sort of the topic and the rationale uh, for this selection. Um, if we just click forward slowly, please. Our fundraiser uh, has been incredibly successful. Uh, and as we near, and we're getting very, very near, 500 million users per month, um, click. <laughs> it works. Uh, when we run the fundraiser, a lot of people see it. I was told around 80 million people a day. Is that about right? Somebody must know. Anyway, it's a pile of people. Uh, and um, one of the things about when 80 million people a day or 500 million people a month see something, click, uh, the internet tries to have a sense of humor. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, some people are funny. I actually like this one. They, they, they were run, passing this around. Scopophobia, the unreasonable fear of being seen or being stared at. I like that one. That's actually funny. Uh, go to the next one. Some people are not. 
these weren't really that funny, you know? The first person who thought of it, I'm like, yeah, okay. The 800th different one, it's just not that funny. So if we click forward a little bit. For me personally, this is not a huge problem. Um, I've been in the public eye for a long time, and I get benefits from it, and there are downsides from it. Uh, one of the funny benefits, which I personally find to be the most amusing aspect of my life, uh, if we click forward one, is that I'm now a watch model. <laughs> and my posters are, and it's, by the way, it's really the most successful in China. Uh, my posters are all over China uh, advertising watches. So I get some benefits uh, from it, and the people know my face. Um, that's all really lovely. But this past year, uh, we had other people who participated, and for them, it maybe doesn't have so many benefits, but they got the downsides of loads and loads of public attention. Uh, can we click forward, please? Um, and so our new hero, uh, the first person who really uh, uh, was able to raise as much money as me because people love giving him money. Uh, if we click forward, Brandon Harris. <laughs> So Brandon, you know, suddenly went from Wikimedia programmer, stay up here on stage for a second, uh, you know, uh, uh, to a sort of international celebrity overnight with all of the downsides and none of the upsides. Um, and so uh, for the prize, uh, I'm going to give him <laughs> my actual watch from Maurice Lacroix. Um, I will also be giving uh, Maggie a, a watch from Maurice Lacroix, um, who, by the way, isn't sponsoring the award. Uh, they just give me uh, watches once a year, um, and I might as well, you know, how many watches do we need? I've got another one at home. Uh, so, there's your watch, and um, thank you so much for being brave enough to go out there and do all that for us. So, thank you. And now, We've got a few minutes left for questions, yeah? About, about 15? Great. Right here, Yeah. Hi, yeah. Yeah. And you and I are on my Facebook page, and everyone saying that I work for you. And yeah. you did not disavow them of that, so if they say, how's Tommy? Yeah. You just play along, say, oh, okay. she's doing fine. Now yeah. my question. No, trust me, because I meet literally thousands of people, and because I have such a terrible memory, I can only remember like Ada's name, um, I'm really good at playing along with, oh yeah, Tommy. Mm, Especially love that guy. when I'm a girl, <laughs> and it's an E on the end. But here's my question. Yes. The Ada initiative is so yes. important, I'd like to see your picture during your fundraiser saying, did you know that your cultural identity, your cultural history, everything that you stand for can be preserved through your participation here. Because yes. I think, right. you know, that's... Absolutely. Important. Yeah, thank so, you so much. Um, I think that's a really great concept. And in fact, uh, Zach is here, and I think we will absolutely test some banners that talk about that, um, exactly that issue. Because I think that's really good, and I'll think about including that idea in my letter, because I think it really means a lot to a lot of people. And as we said before, one of the... Uh, part of the reason we want a lot of people to turn out for the Storytellers uh, event is that the fundraiser provides us two opportunities. One, of course, we need the money, so we need to raise money, and that's very important, and we have to choose the banners that actually perform well. That's a good thing. But it also provides us with an opportunity to uh, let people know that I'm not the boss of Wikipedia, uh, and that you are all the bosses of Wikipedia, and to introduce that idea, and to introduce the idea that um, we're a diverse community and we want to be even more diverse um, and bring lots of people in. Uh, one of the things we absolutely need is more editors. We always need more friends. Uh, and I think the, the fundraiser is an opportunity to do that. And, and so I absolutely agree with you. Okay, next question. So I think I'll do uh, what from before. I think, do we have three microphones? Yes, so somebody over here. And what I recommend, because I'm just gonna be choosing randomly, that the people with microphones go ahead and pre-stage the questions so we don't have to wait. Um, so pick anyone, I don't really care. There's only one question in the audience. Okay, me? Yeah, sure. I don't, uh, don't know so where you are, so. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, Chris Bronk, uh, e Diplomacy, um, and other things. So my question, so you're, you're getting the information the more of the world right at a time when the 
internet is starting to balkanize. And countries are saying, it's our internet, like our country's internet, rather than our planet's internet. How is Wikime the Wikimedia community going to work to fight against that, that breaking apart of the internet? What's, what's your plan? Yes, uh, so that's uh, actually a very, very good question, and it brings us to the broader question of uh, political activism and, and things of that nature. Um, before I, I talk about that, I actually have a, a really great story about, um, about e-diplomacy in the U.S. State Department from uh, many years ago, and uh, I believe it was a different administration at that time, uh, and they would email me. Uh, I got an email saying, hi, we're with the State Department's e-diplomacy initiative, and uh, I'm not sure if they called it that back then, and we think you represent a lot of the really great old-fashioned American values of free speech and generosity, and we think you make a great uh, spokesperson for the U.S., and we would love to support you when you're traveling around and help you sort of arrange things and, and do things. And I said, oh, that's really great. And so um, they said, what can, I said, well, what can I do? That sounds wonderful. And they said, well, we can do a live web chat. And I said, okay. And we'll have about 200 people on it. I'm like, well, okay. I mean, I talk to more people than that every morning, but... Uh, so we did it, and it was really fun because the software, I, I think it was running on uh, a mainframe from the 70s, you know, it was the most outrageous software. So I said, okay, but I did my part, and then a few months later I got an uh, email saying, hi, we're from the State Department, we want to do e-diplomacy, and I'm like, yeah, you already mentioned that before, you forgot me already, uh, and they said, is there anything we can do to help? And I said, yeah, actually, I want to visit Cuba, and I know that for Americans to visit Cuba, it's, you have to get a permit, can you help me work on that? So they sent me a link to the website of the State Department where you can apply for a permit. And I said, well, <laughs> thank you, um, Google. Um, however, I will report that since then, I've had, uh, since the administration changed, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, it may just be a, an ongoing process of modernization, I've had really great support. Uh, when I was in Argentina, the, the, the State Department helped me uh, sort of liaison with the media, I was in Bulgaria, I met with an ambassador. All around the world when I go now, the, the State Department has been much more helpful than they used to be. So thank you, all our friends from the State Department who are here today. Um, it's really great. Now, um, so obviously this year we had a huge impact uh, with uh, uh, preventing the passage of SOPA and PIPA, which I think would have had, uh, in, in many ways, uh, this kind of impact on beginning or, or furthering the process of balkanization. Uh, not least of which because the, the law treated foreign websites differently from domestic websites, and that's sort of the thin edge of the wedge. Um, I think that we will continue to speak out, uh, I will continue personally to speak out against that kind of balkanization of the internet and that kind of uh, impulse to begin closing borders and things like that, because I think it's incredibly uh, unhealthy for the planet, it's unhealthy for free culture, and so forth. Right. Um, we have had now, uh, I would say, three uh, major events uh, in which the Wikipedia community decided to become, uh, to some extent, politically active. Uh, it started with the Italians who went on strike uh, to, I guess, to propose law of uh, Berlusconi. When I first uh, heard about this, um, you, know, I, you know, which by the way, I heard about it like two hours before they went black, um, such as the lovely nature of the randomness of Wikipedia. Um, and uh, at first I thought, and uh, I know, I understand we have like 15 Italians here. I think they'll appreciate my humor here. At first I thought, well, they're Italian, so of course they're on strike. <laughs> it's a really bad joke, but partly true. Um, but um, it was incredibly successful. And I thought, when I, when I heard about it, I thought, well, you know, fine. I think that's actually a perfectly good thing. Uh, I, I thought, well, well, probably we would never do that in English Wikipedia, but it's, I think it's really interesting. Of course, we did end up doing it in, in English Wikipedia, and actually just this week, the Russians decided to go dark uh, for a day uh, to protest uh, censorship law there, and I have no idea yet what the outcome will be, uh, but I'm hopeful because it certainly got a huge amount of press coverage there uh, and around the world, so I'm hopeful that at least it puts uh, uh, governments on notice that, hey, the internet community cares about these things, and they care enough to to actually do something about it, and so that's really important. Uh, I hope that we never have to do it again. I don't want us to become a site that goes on strike every six months over something. I think it should be reserved for only the most serious things that directly impact our work. I also think, yay. <laughs> I also think that we have to be very, very careful about our political neutrality. 
Uh, I think there are many issues that many of us feel very, very passionate about. Uh, you know, if there's an impending war somewhere uh, that many of us feel is the wrong thing, I think it would be very risky for us as a community to start getting involved more and more in different political issues. I think we should restrict it uh, to things that directly impact our work in some fashion. However, what I really think we need to do is to have a big, open, friendly, thoughtful conversation in the community, and I know it's really hard because these are very emotional issues, to begin to help us define more broadly um, before we need to decide at the last minute because some horrible laws about any past, when should we do this and when should we not do that? I think that's something that we need to develop principles around so that when we do it, we know we're doing the right thing and then we really have the support, the full support of as broad a population of the community as possible to know that we're actually doing something sensible and thoughtful. So, having said all that, I think we will continue uh, to, to speak out against these things uh, where necessary. We, we may want to have some kind of a, a strike or whatever. Uh, and I'll do my part as much as possible in when I'm traveling and, and speaking to world leaders. And um, It's sort of funny. One of the, the, the funny things is, of course, everybody thinks I somehow run Wikipedia and that I'm the boss of everything. Uh, so when I go and visit government officials now, they're a little bit afraid. <laughs> and I can kind of look like this, like, don't make me shut down Wikipedia. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's really up to you. It's up to the community to figure out how we're going to move forward. So. Uh, so that's it. Okay, next. We have one question from Twitter. Yes. Are Hello, there, Twitter. Hi, right here. Are there any efforts underway for a media wiki or plain text editor for mobile platforms? I have no idea. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Yes. There's a lot of information on the internet about that. <laughs> um, no, I have to confess, I have done a very poor job of following the mobile initiative, and I know that lots of people are working really hard on mobile. I'm very happy to report that on my little tiny phone, uh, the Wikipedia app looks really good, and the, and the website looks really good. So, In terms of mobile editing, if I speak a little more broadly and more philosophically, I think the mobile editing, no matter how good the interface is, is always going to be very difficult and very problematic, just because of the form factor. If I'm editing on a thing like this, it's really, really hard. However, some people need to do it. Some people can do it. I think it is, uh, you know, when we talk about the next billion people who come online, uh, a huge proportion of them are going to come online uh, in, in developing countries uh, on mobile devices of some kind. So I do think it's important, but I think it'll always be a small percentage of the overall work just because the form factor makes it really, really hard to do no matter how good the interface. Okay? Next, maybe somewhere this way. Hi. I've got, um, regarding like the initiative to uh, diversity. Yes. And you know something I've kind of stumbled upon lately is like there's this really diverse community of women mm -hmm. on the internet from different languages, different cultures, all ethnicities, on YouTube giving makeup tutorials to each other. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they would do this, and in the comments there would always be questions about it. Like one of them was like, people would ask me, what's tight lining? What's tight lining? It's one thing they do it on your eye. Wikipedia, you put the tight line, there isn't even a redirect to eye dot liner, nothing. Yeah. I mean, how much, how can, I mean, we can't, and I think that what she said earlier in the idiot initiative was so great, because we can't like make these people be who we already are on Wikipedia, and that defeats the purpose. Yes. So how can we get to the point where you know they can make videos on commons? Because I mean, if that's what the community's already doing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the diverse yes. female community on the internet is making videos for each other. Right. So, so how can we support them? Yes, I think that is a really fabulous question. I think there are several elements that I can identify for this, um, and I think one of the most important elements is for us to all uh, examine our premises and actually rethink the whole thing. Um, and I, I actually think that uh, uh, makeup tips might be uh, not the best example to use, uh, although it's, it's actually worth talking about, and I'll, I'll talk about fashion in a moment, uh, simply because for the uh, typical tech geek male such as myself, it is very uh, natural and very common if you think, oh, women's topics, uh, you don't think things like reproductive rights, you think, oh, makeup tips. So, uh, so I think that's a risk. One of the risks we run is by thinking of women in, in that fashion. However, uh, and I think this is really important, there was, uh, when, when the, uh, at, at the royal wedding, uh, Kate and, and William got married and it was a huge, you know, billion people watching on television, public event, uh, and somebody started an entry about Kate Middleton's dress. 
and immediately it was posted for uh, for deletion and people thought it's trivia nonsense. How can you have an article about a dress? Uh, and and I I thought about that for a second and I thought well, actually the history of fashion culture uh, you know what the impact of Diana's fashion on the fashion world was tremendous. The impact of Kate, what Kate Middleton wears, uh, in fact, it's quite famously, she wears, quite often, she wears things from, uh, they call it the high street, but basically from department stores, like not expensive clothes. And that's, how, I mean, and whatever she wears, it sells out the next day. Um, it's an enormous cultural impact. And so I actually went into the deletion debate, which I rarely do, and I pointed out that we have on, we have over 100 articles on different Linux distributions. <laughs> Some of them quite uh, obscure and not very popular and, not, and, and virtually no impact on the broader culture. But we think that's perfectly fine, and I think that's perfectly fine. As long as there's reliable sources, we should have it. I said, why don't we have uh, the top 100 most famous dresses? Uh, the things that really, somebody wore something, a famous person or a new designer or something like this, and it changed the face of fashion forever, and it impacted all of our lives in that sort of way. It's culturally very, very important. Uh, and it's very difficult for, for those of us who either have absolutely no fashion sense or if we have a fashion sense, it is simulated because someone picked our clothes for us. Um, and, uh, you know, why don't we? So a part of it is thinking about our own attitudes about when we think about what is, uh, what's encyclopedic or not. If we make that kind of basic error and we think, oh, this can't be encyclopedic because, I don't know, it sounds like some fluffy girl topic. That is a huge mistake. At the same time, I think, you know, how many people in this room are parents? I think that's a really interesting, oh, actually, more than I thought. Well, great, you can help me. Um, that's actually, I'm actually really pleased and surprised about that. Um, maybe it's because we're all getting older. Um, but um, I find, as a parent, um, a lot of our entries on uh, early childhood development are not as good as our entries on the USB standard. And, that is, that absolutely reflects the makeup of our community. And there's nothing wrong with us writing about what we know about, but it's really important that we think more broadly to say, actually one of the weaknesses of Wikipedia that we might be blind to is the topics that we're not totally absorbed by and interested in have very little coverage. And we haven't noticed it because it's not our interest. And so, uh, as was pointed out earlier, when we look at the, the readership numbers and the traffic numbers, it reflects that. That, uh, gee, if you're very, very interested in the cultural impact of fashion, uh, and Wikipedia doesn't have anything, you end up somewhere else, and, and you end up doing something else. Uh, the other thing that I think is really, really important, and I, I talk about this really quite often in the press and, and so on, and I'm always very, very careful uh, to make sure that people understand I am not saying girls aren't good at computers. Um, my father doesn't edit Wikipedia. My father is quite an amateur expert and obsessed with uh, 60, 1960s era muscle cars. It's his hobby, he knows a ton about it. He would not edit Wikipedia. Um, I'm happy to report he has moved beyond the stage of all caps emails. <laughs> but still, when he clicks edit on Wikipedia, and like almost everybody on the planet, he's a perfectly nice person, and he doesn't want to break anything. He clicks edit and he sees all this crazy wiki text markup language, and he's like, I don't really know what to do, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna mess something up. And so I do think the initiatives like the, the visual editor that we're working on, and other initiatives for user engagement that really take into account that, gee, we want to attract a whole group of users who are geeks but not computer geeks. Uh, they know something, they want to share their knowledge, uh, but they're not doing it uh, with us. Uh, when we talk about uh, making videos, uh, or we talk about uh, Pinterest and things like that, we also should remember uh, one of the things that I've seen uh, very, very much uh, is uh, women, uh, parents, uh, a bunch of moms will be together on a Yahoo group mailing list and they're sharing knowledge and, and really quite high level knowledge about their children and about things like this. And it would be nice if they were contributing that knowledge and sort of helping to build a database, but they aren't. And we should really think about, you know, what can we do to facilitate that? So I think there's a lot of pieces to this, uh, starting with our attitude, uh, including the software, including lots of different things. Uh, last year at Wikimania, I spoke about how a lot of our procedures, particularly in English Wikipedia, where it's gotten quite complex, can be quite off-putting to newcomers. You come in and uh, you, you do something that seems sort of obvious to you, and it's wrong, and then it gets reverted, and you really have no idea why, and you don't understand, and somebody tells you you need to use a template, and you're like, what the hell's a template? I have no idea. Uh, so we need to really think about everything that we do 
from that perspective, you know, go through your daily workflow as a Wikipedia and think, gosh, if I were a complete newbie and I weren't really that uh, computer savvy, would I be able to do this? And if the answer is no, then ask yourself, okay, well, what could I change about this workflow? Because we can change our own workflow to make it easier for other people to participate. And sometimes the answer will be there's nothing you can do. Some elements of what we do just have to be kind of hard and complicated. But a lot of it is hard and complicated for no apparent reason, in my personal opinion. Okay? Next. Two more questions. Um, hello? Oh, good answer. Okay. I thought she was cheering that there were only two more questions. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, people are getting hungry. Um, I, where is the microphone? Somebody can just, from this side of the room, whoever has a microphone, speak up. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is not much of a question. Uh, I'm just going back to the beginning of your talk. Uh, you ask uh, people to stand up by, by year. Yep. So I would like to, the, the people who started editing in 2012 only, to stand up again, please. please yeah, please go on. So yep. these people deserve a round of applause. Yeah. As much as the people who started in 2001, uh, please, thank you. I, that is really great. So I think next year I'll start from the other end uh, and go that way. Uh, okay, one more question. Um, somewhere vaguely over this direction. Whoever has a microphone. Wherever. Here. This fellow here, he's got his hand the highest for the longest. Here we go. Uh, hi, Jimmy. Hi. Uh, we met yesterday night at yes. the party, and um, you know I'm from China. There's um, internet censorship in China, and my question is uh, how to develop and improve Wikipedia in countries and regions which are under the internet censorship, do you see? Thank you. Yes, great. So, uh, I mean, the situation in China, of course, is much better than it was. Uh, we were completely banned in China for about three years. Uh, now, Wikipedia is broadly accessible in China, but certain pages are filtered. Um, I've met uh, with the, the Minister of the State Council Information Office, um, I think four times now, uh, Ting and I, uh, who is, oh by the way, I have an announcement, uh, we'll get to that. Um, Ting and I went and visited him in, in Beijing and so forth, uh, and our current situation with China I think is uh, uh, stable. Uh, I don't think they'll just block us randomly without talking to us, but I also think they're not about to open up more pages that are, are, that are blocked now. In terms of advice for uh, the community, um, I think there are a lot of different things that people can do, particularly as uh, in, in many of the places where there's censorship, the, the language is a large enough language that there are people from outside the country who can do things that people from inside the country can't. I remember years ago when, when the Taiwanese uh, community were telling me about how they were helping the, the Beijing Wikipedians, whenever they were blocked, they would help them find a new anonymous proxy uh, to be able to edit. They would just sort of go onto the Skype channel and, and do that. And I think there's a lot of things that people can do like that. Uh, to help each other, because in many uh, countries, the censorship is really quite local uh, to their local political situation. And so if, if, if you live in one country where uh, your local politicians' pages are blocked and it's hard for you to edit them, you should maybe do a trade with somebody in another country who their local politicians are blocked and write about each other's politicians or something like that. Um, you know, I think... Uh, the other thing you can do, uh, and, and this is, unfortunately, this is something that is going to be a bit small scale, but if you reach the right people, it can be really powerful, is learn about circumvention tools, uh, learn which ones are convenient and fast, and teach other people how to use them, and help spread that knowledge peer to peer through the culture, so that people really can work their way around censorship. I think it's incredibly uh, important, uh, which unfortunately, it will be small scale, because you'll only be able to reach people who are technologically savvy, um, the other thing you can do is if those tools, a lot of the circumvention tools, things like Tor, are uh, too slow and too hard to use for a lot of people. And so if you're, if you're tech savvy yourself, um, I think that a lot of the open source projects that are dealing with that kind of thing, they need help. They need more developers, uh, people to be passionate about that kind of thing. So uh, I believe that is my last question. 
and I just want to thank everyone for coming. Oh, one more announcement. Uh, Jan Bart is about to, you know, burst a blood vessel here. Um, uh, so Ting, our, our previous chair, has unfortunately uh, retired from being the chair of the board, and yesterday we elected uh, our new overlord, uh, which is Kat Walsh. Please stand up. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, for your wonderful address, and congratulations to Kat Walsh on her election to the chairmanship. And thank you, everyone, for attending this morning's opening session. Uh, before you migrate next door to the Marvin Center, I'd like to make some announcements about the schedule. There is a press conference in this room at 11.20. Members of the press and anyone interested are invited to attend. Please remember that Unlike our printed schedule, the website schedule is the most up-to-date. So in addition to a few last-minute shifts, I'd like to highlight in particular that Saturday morning's opening session will take place here in Lisner and not in the Betts Theater as previously announced. Uh, for the latest schedule, be sure to check Twitter and signs posted throughout the venue. With that said, to, to the 87 countries represented here at Wikimania, go and partake in Wikimania.